the years, marketers have been analyzing the different generations, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials. And recently we have seen there's a red thread among all of them, speed. They all want everything to happen now. My name is Francisco Serrano, and I am the Chief Speed Officer at One to One and the host of the Now Gen podcast. Join me. Each episode, we talk about what's happening with brands, see how brand professionals across different industries cope with this fast changing market, and live up to the expectation of this now generation. Welcome. This episode is brought to you by One to One. The fastest day-to-day -day design and content studio. For more than 17 years, One to One has been their premier partner for many Fortune 500 companies, proving that tight deadlines shouldn't be a hassle. Oh, well, welcome back. And uh, we have an interesting show today. We're going to be talking about the importance of speed and agility in the data-driven digital marketing. And for this, I have a very interesting guest today. His name is Rahul Chowdhury. He's the Chief Marketing and Digital Officer at Cuno and Vice President for Cuton Research Institute. Before that, he was a Global Director for LISO, and he's an expert in digital and e -com. So we're very happy to have you, Rahul. Welcome. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you for calling me to the show. Uh, it's exciting times. And just the way you said data-driven digital marketing, it is a mouthful <laughs> and, and it actually is. Uh, that's the world we live in today. I know, it's, it's kind of impressive how uh, everybody it's now driven about, if you have something to say and it's not based out of data, then your opinion does not count. Right. Yes, it is. And, and I think uh, as marketers, uh, each word has a lot of weight and putting one and one, it, it doesn't add, it multiplies. Data driven and data driven marketing, they are very strong and big concepts. And the impact of that is exponential. But the way to execute that, the challenges and operational challenges are also exponential. Yes, I know. And, but before I know, we have a lot of talk about, but before we dive into the subject, tell us a little bit about you and, and where you're coming from, a little bit of your experience and your background so that uh, the audience knows a bit about you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for calling me, the, inviting me to this uh, podcast. Uh, I'm glad to share my experiences. I have been in the marketing for probably 15 plus years, started my career in the traditional brand marketing, p &L management kind of a space, uh, worked, have worked across probably four or five different industries from starting from personal care, tobacco, vitamin and supplements, uh, household goods, food. Uh, so really built that breadth uh, in, my, in my career. Um, I, I used to work initially, I started my early marketing career for a subsidiary of British American Tobacco uh, in, in India. Uh, so I had a bit of an international experience there, a very grassroots kind of a marketing experience. Then came here to school, uh, restarted my career um, uh, with Reckitt, which has been an amazing place for me to again uh, dive deep into uh, a more mature economy, a mature market. I worked on Lysol for uh, quite a uh, lot number of years, but I did really get experience into brand and tradition, traditional marketing. Over the course of the last five, six years, I have increasingly moved on to digital, just being fascinated by where the world is going towards and how we can sharpen our tools and have uh, spent a lot of time on digital marketing, e-commerce marketing. And that's where I ended up here, where I'm currently uh, leading all marketing efforts, all digital and e-com efforts for, I like to call it a mature startup. Uh, we, we, we are a brand called QNOL, very well known in the vitamin supplement space, but still quite small for, uh, compared to what, where all I was before. Yeah, I, I know. I noticed we were talking about off the air about the, uh, that I experienced this brand with the, the famous enzyme that you guys are famous for right now, the CoQ10, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, and it's amazing. Tell us a little bit about uh, QNOL. And, and, and I was 
interested about the Kewton Research Institute? Yeah, Kunal, I, I joined uh, this company this year. Uh, I was fascinated by the product, and I really believe that they, uh, uh, the founder and the company has been able to really address a big challenge that adds value to a lot of consumers who are not aware about it. So essentially, CoQ10 or coenzyme Q10 is an ingredient in our own body, which is responsible for uh, transmitting energy from one cell to another. And 97% of the energy in everybody's cell is transmitted through coenzyme Q10. It's that integral. But what happens over the course of time is uh, as you grow older, your body stops producing it or minimizes, reduces production of coenzyme Q10. That leads to feelings like fatigue, just, just not having the, the energy to get going with life. And particularly if you are a heart patient, um, any many of the statin uh, drugs actually, while they shut off cholesterol, they also shut off the production of coenzyme Q10. So one of the most direct effects that a lot of statin users see uh, or feel is that they don't feel they feel uh, they don't have any energy. They feel that life has got sucked out from them. What the solution for that is, just supplement coenzyme Q10 and have that over and above what your body produces over and above what you get from food, but supplement that enough to bring the level back up in your blood. Now, there are a lot of, co a lot of brands who have coenzyme Q10, uh, but the challenge that the category always had for the last 20, 25 years is that you can eat as much as you want. The coenzyme Q10 does not get absorbed by your body naturally. So what QNOL brought in, and this has been a journey in the last 10 years, is a patent where it, it has 3x more solubility or uh, absorption than a normal CoQ10. So we essentially have exploded this category and made this category much more, uh, what do you say, um, much more uh, valuable for a lot of people who either don't know about it or probably took it and were not getting the benefit. And now they have a valid reason for um, having coenzyme Q10, which not only helps your heart, uh, but also has a lot more uh, benefits beyond just heart health. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to you about it. I, I, my top of mind was the enzyme was related to heart. And, 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 and what about what is the Cuton Institute, Research Institute? That's a parent company who owns the brand, oh. right? And that's a company uh, who, who, who got the product into the market. It's a science-based uh, company, which means that we are very really integral with science. We know that the supplement category is, is there are tons and thousands of brands and everybody claims to be uh, different efficacy, but you really have to be into, uh, basing out on clinical studies and on science. So q Institute is the, the one which leads the way and they are the one who have the, the details of the product. Oh, okay. And, and tell me about, I'm going to dive into digital. I know because I have done my homework mm -hmm. that back in 2012, you were the, one of the first to do a, a Facebook page in India, right? For a product. Yeah. So it's a long way from there. Where are you now? What, what, what is, what has evolved the, the Rahul from now? Yeah, it's, a, it's fascinating. I think 2010 was when I, when I was launching the first Facebook page for my company, which is the number one uh, or among the number one CPT company in India. And I was just fascinated with, oh, we're creating Facebook page, right? Uh, what's going to happen with us? But what intrigued me is, um, is there was no benchmark. There was no best practice. There was like, hey, we're going to do this. Somebody told us to do this. And that's the mindset with which you had to go in. Right, uh, uh, you had the people who had 25, 30 years of experience who were the best marketeers. They were also at exactly the same page as you were. We were all trying to figure it out ourselves. For me, that was a bit of an eye opener, which said the rules of the game are going to be are changing drastically in 10 years. Um, you can be smarter than many other people who had years of experience because you figure it out faster than what somebody else can. Right. And for me, that was the place where I said, we, in many of the emerging markets, you copy what's happening in the mature market. 
which means that, hey, this is what Facebook in US is doing. This is what uh, the, 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 the developed markets are doing and we just need to do that. There isn't really a lot of new thinking. But for me, the journey was how do I jump ahead and learn where the industry is moving? How do I get to that wavelength where I am leading along with the industry and learning faster than the industry to become more relevant? So that brought me here. And it's been a journey from Facebook, launching a Facebook page to say likes is everything that matters, to say Facebook likes does not even matter. To start with, and I remember in 2015 when Amazon launched their Amazon search, we were one of the first brands to be tight where Amazon said, I do not know what it means, but I have something called Amazon search. And we said, okay, it makes sense that we try it to where now we are spending millions of dollars on Amazon search. So, but it always keeps evolving. There is never an end. I also, by the way, believe that in the US, we are still catching up in the whole digital space. Like when I look at, and I was just on a call about China, and I look about the marketing levers that they have in market like China and Korea, there's so much. Like live streaming is going to be a big way of selling. We are seeing that in Instagram. We are seeing that in all of different things. That is yes to catch up. There is three, four more steps that I can clearly see that's going to happen in the digital journey from just creating a Facebook page to live streaming in 10 years. I do not know where we end 2030. Yeah. And, and, and I want to ping you on that. And, yeah. uh, you know, the now gen is constantly wanting a, a instant gratification, right? And, and the market is changing constantly. You were talking about that. Uh, and technology, people, needs, you know, uh, moments of purchase, uh, impulse buying. Um, and I would imagine that uh, also in the e com world, that changes too, right? So what does that mean? And, and how do you use data to make that change one that works for your brand? So does that mean change the whole website again and again? Or what does it mean to get from your seat, of course, uh, having that data and using it in e-com and digital in order to make this change uh, more sense for your brand? It's a very heavy question, right? And when you even say, what does that mean? A lot of people are trying to figure out what actually is supposed to mean, right? Um, there are a few principles, however, I think I own to in trying to find the meaning, right? The first most important principle that we all probably agree is there is nothing static and that learning curve will never saturate, at least in the near term. So what does that mean is having a team, having processes, having the agility to be able to uh, always disrupt yourself. The second, what does it mean is, it's a question about skill set. It's a question about um, who's going to lead that way. I probably being the CMO or anybody who's in the marketing leadership might not actually have the skill set. But then who and how do you spot that skill set? How do you bring that, uh, that person in uh, and give them the freedom to chart their own way while guiding and nudging them? right? That's what it means. Um, I have been scaling up my team here just to make it future ready. And, and it, the challenges I was recruiting heavily two years back when I was part of Reckit, I'm just seeing a difference in talent. I'm seeing a difference in expectation, right? Of just digital. Uh, diff like previously, what people call the base digital toolkit is also changing. Right. So how do as recruiters also, how do you bring in that team is very different. What is that? What does it mean? The third is what does that mean? It also means uh, how does consumer and business evolve? So you could have the agility and the mindset, you could have the talent, but understanding how do you see your business with, along with the consumer in 2530, in the year 2025, in the year 2030, that also is a mean. Again, so what I'm essentially telling you are questions we have, but what does it mean is finding an answer continuously for this, right? Just to give an example of how I see it, when I say, okay, when I look at 2022, I have each of these three different channels. 
what does it mean for agility and the now generation for me in 2022 is how do I create an operating model processes which can continuously disrupt? What did we know about 2021 is not going to be relevant now. What is going to be relevant also? Where do we need to double down? How, who do I need to add to the team? What skill set am I missing? For example, I quoted live streaming. I don't have a person who does it, but it's a place where I want to explore. How do I build that capability and skill set? And then third is, the, the, the now about the consumer is, the consumer has changed a lot. When we, as we come out of COVID, what categories are they going to buy the way they bought before? What categories are they going to move on to? What part of my business has a risk? And what part of my business has an opportunity? Understanding that, crystallizing that, and then converting that, connecting all of those down together is the marketing, the now generation marketing that we have to get to. Yes, I, I, as you were saying, I am constantly talking to people and uh, you know, talking to uh, individuals that are building teams like you are, and, and they are creating job positions that I've never heard they existed before. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Amazon likes on Google, and I'm like, what? Yeah, and yeah, what does this guy is going to do, right? So but yeah, it's, it's just, and probably that position is not going to be vacant. Uh, I mean, it's going to be vacant now, but in the future, it's going to disappear because it's no longer ad, adds value. So it's just like testing and going and moving and, and, and just investigating what's out there, right? So yeah, uh, yes, yes. And, and what is constant is the brand, insight, and data, right? You spoke about data a little bit. Uh, all of this is not possible if you do not have a rich way of understanding what's happening. And that's based on data and then analyze, analytics, which converts the data into insight. Because I have also been in conversations with a lot of people who want to move, but they have no light on where to move. And then it's in that case, it's just the wheel that is trying to keep rotating, doesn't go anywhere. Right? That's, a, that's a, the, the key formula for burnout. You have a ton of different people. You all want to move. There isn't any data. There isn't any uh, process of building learnings together. And you're just trying and doing different things. I like to say that there is a, there is a, a saying in this company where I joined where the founder said, if you're not able to scale something, then that's a hobby. Right? And we need to really move from hobby to driving a business. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And talking about data, can you give us an example, of course, that you can share with us of how you used in the past, either in this or another or any company, data in order to demonstrate, uh, to use it in an agile way. Uh, so you got the data, you reacted, then you changed the course and it was a success or a failure, you know? Yeah, no. Uh, I think um, 2020 was a big year for us to question what data we had, question the agility of the data, right? Because I remember in February, March, we had a solid plan of winning the year. And come March, every plan got tossed out, right? Yes, there were bigger macro changes of uncertainty of people not going out and come people working from home. But the biggest thing as a market year that I was struggling with, what is the new consumer behavior? And how do we get across it, not based on what we hear, but based on actual data? And how we then refine that insight into what should be a new marketing strategy pretty much between three months. That was a challenge we had, and that's a question that we had. We knew that people are gonna come and buy online. Great, what is the need that they have? Is it just replacement? Are they looking for different products? What do they need at their home now, which they never needed before? So that was a good, moment for us to say, what insight tools do we have? How can we build up quick insight tools and data tools? Um, what do we know about a consumer now in the last 30, 60 days? And we'll have to go in with that assumption. So essentially we built a few tools in house. We had a few tools, we customized them, redeployed them uh, to what you call social listening, to what you call just getting a bit of a feeler of where is it? Again, I keep saying that the basic concept of all of this is that you will never have 100% of your answer. 
I think Jeff Bezos says it is that if you have 100% of your answer, you're too late. You will have to go in with 80% of your answer and a gut feel. But it's better than going in with no data and just a gut feel. Uh, but essentially, that was a time when from April till May, June, I remember, we, we tweaked a lot. We got in a lot of more social listening tools. We got in a lot more reading the numbers a little bit more to see which categories are growing, which categories are slowing down. And then you match the quantitative data with the qualitative data, you start getting strong insights. And what we ended up doing with that is we pretty much flexed all of our marketing spend into categories which we had never thought before. Wow. Right. And those are the categories that gave us much faster growth um, than even a brand like Lysol. Uh, really? Not that Lysol would not have grown, but just that Lysol had its own big curve. And then you went out of stock, like you went for toilet paper. But then the question was, we can't be sitting, but you just realized there are other nascent needs that were untapped that started coming up. And we were at the right spot to leverage that, to find that and to activate on that. Be wow. it dishwashing detergent, be it baking as a concept, which led to things like easy off growing, right? So these are all things that you will be able to tap ahead of the time and put dollars behind it because we believed in it and it grew faster. Wow. I, I, I mean, I just get the, the shingles right now just listening at it because to, to really mastermind something like that and really see it a success and really getting into the channel, the product and actually selling and everybody saying, yeah, it worked and all everything came because of analyzing data. I in three months. And the challenge is you, you I'm sure wow. people would have got that in within six, eight months. But by that time, everybody was trying to figure it out. You just need to be faster than the previous guy. Wow. So, and, and coming back to, you know, you're not alone. You have assembled a team, uh, what does it take to be a leader in the now gen? I mean, with the now gen that, that they want rewards also as, you know, as a team member, they will like ask you for rewards too, because you're not, so it's kind of a 360 uh, instant gratification. How do you become such a great leader in this generation? Um, it's, it's tough. Right. It's a very interesting generation that we are leading. Uh, I just feel proud about every person that I see and every person uh, that I'm seeing. I just see that they're so much more bright and so much more sharper than we were. Right. We came in with, with a very traditional mindset and we're learning, but they're starting with a very complex, uh, complex environment. Uh, but I think there are a few things that have helped me. Right. Uh, number one is. Um, authentic. You have to be authentic. This generation, like you said, the now generation is no bullshit generation. Like they will say it on your face, and they uh, they are very vocal about it, and and they can see through it, right? So that's that's one big piece which I always carry at because it's not about what you tell them; it's about about who you are, and you whoever you are, you would not be appealing to everyone, but you would be appealing to many, and finally you want somebody who wants to figure it out as badly as you want to figure it out. Um, but I think from what has helped me get the most out of uh, them and make them smarter every day and better marketeers every day is number one, sharing the vision. They want to be part of it. They won't, don't want to be told what to do. They want to say, where are we going? And then that's the first big piece, right? Is you have to be visionary. You have to be exciting. You have to be able to uh, share the strategy and, and be open to hear from them, right? That vision is very key. The second is being democratic. You are a, equally a disciple as them in because probably you know equal to or less than what they know of their own field. I have a search expert, I have a social media expert, I have a, a, a creative designer expert, and I don't know more than any one of them in their field. So I'm equally a, a disciple in them, but we all listen together and we challenge each other uh, and we try to uh, go ahead with what we think is the best. Uh, I would tell for people who our leaders, but at the same time, remember something that you have that probably many of the generation, the new generation don't have is fundamentals of marketing. We think consumer, they think activation, they think channel, they think media tactics, we think consumer. 
And so that's a great way of you balancing out, but say, okay, from a marketing principle, how does this work? And that's been some of the, the, the best, I think, discussions where they have, where they say, hey, you do this on Facebook and you do that on Facebook and you get this return. I said, great, but how does, it doesn't really play with, how is the consumer journey? That's where you challenge them back. You have to be democratic, but you have to do that. And the third is, uh, I also think they need a little bit of coaching and mentoring. They are very young, they're very bright, they have so much more ahead of them. And having someone who can be a mentor, they're probably looking for mentors, not leaders. And they will follow their mentors everywhere, not necessarily leaders. Because they have, as much as they have answers, they have equal number of questions for which they don't have answers. And, and uh, being able to have a sounding board is a really helpful thing for them. So that's what has worked for me. Vision, democratic, being a disciple, and then mentorship. Oh, mentorship. Yeah, I, I, I know that uh, uh, from my personal experience, uh, I have seen a lot in the market that the more flexible you are nowadays, the better. Because, you know, that constant change that you talk about, if, if you're stiff and you don't want to change and you're not flexible and adaptable, then you're not going in the right direction, right? So, yeah. And, and you, you, you assembled the team. This is not your first time you assembled teams, right? You, you, you've assembled multiple times. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's been an uh, extreme pleasure and I would say um, privilege to assemble a team. I always like to say that I, you always feel you're assembling a band of Avengers. That's the, that's the tone that I always use because everybody has a unique skill. You are no one than just finding who is the right skill at the right time. And then they just work as an amazing group of inventors. And you have yeah. the joy of seeing them becoming their own superpower. Yeah, it, it, I, I saw your brand innovators presentation about that and it was very enlightening. Yeah. Uh, and nowadays people we think that because of technology, people are not there and they don't count. And, and I say that now more than ever, even, even if there's AI, you're always going to need the people to make sense of it all, right? So you need to assemble something. So coming back to your history and, and I'm moving back, let's go to the time machine right now and tell me, tell me a time that you really felt proud about Rahul and said, ah, I love you, Rahul. I'm very proud of you. I'm sure there are a lot of times, but just pick one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the way we navigated COVID uh, as, as a team, as a company, as adding value to consumers' life, being able to solve many of the problems that consumers uh, had or uh, people had at that time with a brand was uh, quite um, satisfying period for us, right? It was a lot of ambiguity for me, my team, uh, for the company and for our consumers. But one step at a time, we all ended up in uh, doing better. Okay, awesome. Well, kudos for that. Congratulations, because people think, hey, you sold everything by itself. You just go to the office, turn on the coffee maker, and that's it. And like, yeah, it's not nothing. That. Nothing ever happens by itself. Right. Uh, if there was everything that happened by itself, there would be 101 companies out there. Exactly. Doing it by itself. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, okay. Before we move to the end of our interesting interview, I want to ask you if you were to give away, a, a, you know, a takeaway to all the listeners out there that are just building teams and the e com and they're talking about data and all that what would be one learning that you would leave? Because I know you said there was a dense answer to the question of the data and speed, you know, but uh, something simple that they can nibble and take away and use it in their brands. What would you tell them? Get to the depth, but don't tangle yourself into it. Right. So what does that mean is yeah, gone are the days where we used to buy TV how many GRPs per week? Okay, how should the flighting be? What is the cost of GRP? And that's it, right? Um, gone are those days. You have to understand the depth of how does this tool work alone? How do you, uh, what is it different about? Uh, how do you uh, buy it? How does it interact with the consumer? But at the same time, when you put 10 different levers together, you cannot complicate it so much that you just lose track of where you are. 
So that's one of the pieces that I always say, you have to get the depth um, and, 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 and still stay above float. And the second thing is understand the consumer. The consumer makes very simple decisions, right? Um, they resonate to a very simple message. They, they, their life is anyway very complicated. We are not selling rockets. We are selling very simple products, at least in the CPG space. Um, so the way you talk with them, creatives, packaging, uh, brand message, uh, consistency, that all of them have to be simple and sometimes it just, it works. Uh, we, some, we as marketers overcomplicate things many, many times and including me. Right, uh, and, and uh, as much as we do it, we need to step back many times, sit back and say, uh, how is the consumer going to respond to it? Like every creative has to have 10 different things you want to say. Every creative has to have pricing, promotion, uh, call out the brand in the big shape and the consumer and the consumer inside. Uh, we have to simplify that. Yeah, sometimes we feel that it's not enough. It's like, it cannot be that simple, right? It's just... <laughs> Boom. But anyways, that's that's the way life works sometimes. Not only I, I, yeah. I, I always say is like the most fascinating thing about digital is that there's always somebody who is trying to do something different and you can just learn from them. And and what digital native brands have taught many of us is that simplicity wins in many different ways. Um, simplicity and say it in a different way or communicate in a different way or reached out in a different way just becomes makes sense and it becomes intuitive later on. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, uh, Rahul. Now, uh, to our final segment, it's a little bit of a fun question for you, right? Um, you said you didn't have any boundaries, uh, so I'm gonna ask you a question. Uh, since you are a brand expert, I would like to get your two favorite brands of cereal. I know that you're. I know that you're a cereal fan, so that's why. Two uh, preferred <laughs> brand of cereals and why? Uh, this is fun. I I I I I do not know where you got that. That I'm a cereal fan. Um, you, I guess you're talking about eating cereals, right? Uh, yeah. I am a hardcore loyalist from a cereal standpoint. I have. Uh, I eat Kellogg, Raisin Bran, Crunch. I don't change it for a time. It's right here, backside. It's sitting out there. Yeah. Uh, you can see that out there. I know, it, I know. That it, it, like sometimes you, you have heard about the black t-shirt thing where you don't, every day morning you wake up, you just wear the black t-shirt, you don't think. Yes. Me, it's the same thing. It's don't overcomplicate. I like that. It stays on. I don't want to try different things. So I have only one. <laughs> oh, only one. And... Do you have it because of, of the practicity or because of the brand or because of the flavor or because of all of the above? Uh, I think somewhere in my mind, I felt that uh, it's perception, but I felt that it was more healthier than a lot of other sugary things, uh, the oats and the, and, and the fiber of it. And I do not know when in the last 10 years I made the choice. And then since then, I haven't really tried to challenge my perception. One of the places where I need to go back and redo the learning curve, like we said, there are new things in the market every time. But sometimes as consumers, you just want to live in the bubble that you have. Is that life is fine. Don't exactly. overcomplicate it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to like overcomplicate it in, in your options of what to have for breakfast, right? Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So anything else you want to add before I wrap up this uh, interview, Rahul? Mm, I just want to wish everyone who is listening to this uh, podcast and you, Francisco, uh, have a very happy and hope, hopefully 2022 is the end of uh, all the darkness that we have seen for the last few years. It's a much needed break that mankind needs, uh, even though it doesn't look like now uh, in the last two, three weeks. But I'm very positive that uh, we as human beings will survive and, and we will do good for the world because the world needs it. So I just want to wish everybody a very happy 2022 and a more prosperous and healthy 2022, including you, Francisco. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, best wishes going your way to uh, Rahul. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, we'll be, we've been talking to Rahul Chowdhury, Chief Marketing and Digital Officer for QNO and Vice President of the Cuden Research Institute. Uh, Rahul, where can people reach you if they want to? LinkedIn, is it a good place? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, again, uh, I, I do not know how what value I can offer, but definitely, yes, if there's a conversation, interesting conversation, uh, Q, uh, LinkedIn is the place. I am dying to meet people in person and getting into those conferences that we have. I think that's the one big piece I miss. We particularly work in a startup is that you are within your own bubble, but I think there's a lot more that we need to catch on. Exactly. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Rahul. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the most relevant power brands, please do not, do not uh, lose the next episode of the Now Generation. Stay, stay tuned and listen to all these brand talks that I have with all these experts. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.